This is the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Luke. Glory to you, Lord when the days drew near for Jesus to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem, and he sent messengers ahead of him. On their way, they entered a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him, but they did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. When his disciples James and John saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them. Then they went on to another village. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. To another, he said, follow me. But he said, first, let me go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, let the, bury de de let the dead bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Another said, I will follow you, Lord, but, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. And Jesus said to him, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. The gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. First off, I want to say kudos to Sharon for getting those tongue twisty names right. Well done. I was in a bar last week and I met an atheist. And we had a conversation which turned into a debate, which turned into a heated argument, at the end of which he decided to cite Jesus as his Lord and Savior. That didn't happen. Well, <laughs> that's never happened. I, I was in a bar with Rob, I, I will admit to that, but the rest of it, I totally made up. Because I'm pretty sure there is no one ever in the history of Christianity who has ever accepted Jesus because they were browbeat into it. I mean, there may be people who like go through the forms and say the words, but their hearts aren't changed by it. And I'm reminded of this because this week in our weekday service, we celebrated the Feast of St. Alban. And St. Alban was the first British martyr. He was martyred in the third century. He was a Roman soldier who had converted to Christianity, which was not looked kindly upon. And so his uh, authorities tried to browbeat him into returning to traditional Roman religious views, but he did not. He stood stand fast, and, and for that, he lost his life. That when people have a true conversion that rests and lives in their hearts, they are not easily moved out of that, and they are certainly not moved out of that through coercive acts. And Jesus kind of speaks to this, and Paul really speaks to this in today's readings. Here in this reading today, we have Jesus, and he has set his face on Jerusalem. This is an important turning point in the Gospel of Luke. He's been in Galilee. He's been doing miracles. He's been healing people. He's been teaching. He's been preaching. He's been going to the synagogues. He's been gathering people by the thousands. They come to see Jesus, to hear his words, to feel his touch, to be renewed. But now the time has come for him to glorify himself and to glorify his father by going to Jerusalem and facing up to the authorities, knowing full well that it will end in his own death, but that the power of his death will break death's grip on us forever. So he turns his face to Jerusalem and he sends out messengers ahead of him to prepare his way. And they come to a village of the Samaritans. And what's important about the Samaritans is they're Jewish, but they don't believe that the temple should be in Jerusalem. They think it should be on their mountain in Samaria. This is the big debate between Jewish people of the first century. Where should the temple be? Most people thought it should be in Jerusalem. The Samaritans think it should be somewhere else. And so when they hear about Jesus who has set his face on Jerusalem, they reject him because he's going to the wrong mountain. And so when they get to that village, they turn them away. And James and John, the ones who always want to be the most important, the ones who want to be at the right and left hand of Jesus, to the point where they ask their mom to please Jesus and let them be number one and number two. They say, Jesus, do you want us to rain down fire on them? And Jesus is like, no. 
No, we don't want to rain down fire on them. That is not the way of love. Let's just move on somewhere else. Maybe we'll get back to this place. And so he continues on his path to Jerusalem. And Paul talks about this very strongly, that, that we are called to live in a freedom. But it's not a freedom that allows us to do whatever we want. We aren't autonomous individuals who can take whatever we can by, by right of force. That's not the way of love. That's selfish. It's evil. Jesus, Paul rather, Paul tells us that we should cultivate a freedom, not a freedom to do what we want, but a life filled with freedom from the power of evil. Now, this is, this is a really important distinction, that the freedom that Jesus talks about, the freedom that Paul talks about, the freedom that Christians are offered is not a freedom to go and do whatever you can get away with. It is a freedom from the grip of evil on our lives. That the power that evil has in our lives is only equal to the power we are willing to give it. Jesus has freed us from that grip, and yet so often we return to throw ourselves into its arms. We are called to a freedom from evil so that we can pursue the path of love. And it's a path that doesn't lead to, what is it, quarrels and jealousy and anger and dissension and factions and, and idolatry and things like these. It is not the path that leads to anger and fear and people telling you what you ought to do and coercion. That's not the way of love. The Jesus shows us that the way of love is both easier to understand and much harder to accomplish, and that there are costs to following the path of love. Jesus himself paid the cost of his own mortal life, and yet in doing so, he destroys the power of evil over us and death itself, so that we too may participate in his eternal life through our faith. But faith is not about getting into heaven. Faith is about living as if we were in heaven right now, that the incarnation teaches us that this world in which we live matters and is important. That we aren't just here like at a bus station waiting to go somewhere better. That this place matters. This world matters. Your lives matter. And the lives of those around us matter. And so we are called to live as if we were in the kingdom of God, to follow that way of love, to not give in to the temptations that evil offers us, but instead to hold fast and firm to the signs that Jesus has showed us so that we might walk the narrow way. And that when we walk this way of love, we get what Paul calls the fruits of the Spirit, these things that that are like love and joy and peace and patience and kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. These fruits are the faith. I think if we all think about the kind of lives we would like to live, the lives we would like for our societies, we would want one that is filled with love and joy and peace and patience and kindness over and above one that is filled with jealousy and anger and quarrels and factions. It is self-evident that the way of love is the deepest yearnings of our hearts. And so Jesus calls us to to not try to use the coercive acts to impose our will and our morality on others, but rather through the example of love to build peace and friendship and reconciliation so that everyone might know and experience what it is to be holy and fully loved in the way that we are by our God. Amen.